I'm Mark Seichter. And I'm Linda Zayas Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Welcome, everyone, to RK Mark Asks Starfinder Lead Designer Joe Pacini. Welcome, Joe, to the show. Thank Hi, you Joe. very much for having me. Hi. Absolutely. So, Joe, uh, on this show, we, we almost oh, pretty much always start with the same two questions. So, for your first question, answer the more interesting combination of how you got <laughs> started playing uh, tabletop role playing games and or pathfinder okay uh to go back a little bit i i don't have as much experience as many of our colleagues including yourselves uh but every time i say that it's been a little bit longer since last time i said it and therefore <laughs> i have a little more experience and i thinking about it uh it's been probably about almost 10 years since i started really running and playing uh role-playing games but i did in high school, have a failed attempt to play role-playing games with my friends. Um, our GM got a cool friend who thought we were too nerdy and wanted to do other cool things besides play role-playing games. And so our GM poofed in a dragon and killed us all in one session, and that was it. <laughs> so I was just <laughs> not, not cool nice. enough to play uh, role-playing games back in the day. So you did but, play it, though, but it was just yeah. not a very good session. <laughs> Otherwise, I just got to read the books and, and page through things. Uh, and then more recently, which is now almost 10 years ago, my goodness, uh, <laughs> I, I ran a campaign of 13th Age, which is a sort of gridless right. uh, D20 game, uh, and ran that for a few years. And then Pathfinder-wise, I honestly didn't know much about Pathfinder until I started working at Paizo. I knew they made cool products that I bought to use in my 13th age game, such as pawn, <laughs> pawn boxes uh, and the Game Mastery Guide uh, from first, first edition, of course. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until I started working at Paizo that I really started playing and getting into the into that well, that's particular second, system. Well, that's our second question. Yeah. Like, how did you get started working at Paizo? Everyone has their own unique trajectories, and it's super interesting to hear them all. They sure do. Let's see if I can keep the <laughs> streak going. Uh, <laughs> I would say I, I've had a lot of really weird jobs, but I think the you could you could trace the trajectory to working at Nintendo as a game tester. Uh, that's kind of where I started in the game industry in general, uh, and then I became an, a text editor there, uh, specifically working on the text of mostly localized uh, Japanese games. And then I uh, transitioned to being a contract editor for Paizo, so that's that was my first gig. I did exactly one freelance contract and then was hired on as a contract editor for about six months uh, along with Liz Liddell which was cool although she'd been doing a lot of freelance before that point right yeah uh, then I became a full-time editor uh, hired on permanently and then and then a, and then a developer uh, for Pathfinder starting with War for the Crown with Crystal Frazier's sweet uh, Pathfinder first edition campaign and then uh, eventually became a Starfinder dev. Oh, and it doesn't end there, does it? No, now no, I'm doesn't. Starfinder lead designer. <laughs> that's, right. the story, that's another thing that gets longer every time I tell it. Is this, that's right. This... All, the different, all the different roles uh, that you felt at the company. So uh, what kinds <laughs> yeah. of games did you work on? You, you said you generally worked on localizations with Nintendo. Did you work on any uh, famous titles that people may have heard of? Uh, potentially Animal Crossing with the new one out, which I am playing a ton of, by the way. Uh, new Leaf, the sort of 3DS version, I was very heavily involved in that with the text, especially, mm. uh, which was great. And a bunch of stuff, you know, various Marios. <laughs> mm. And uh, I'm kind of blanking on on them now. Picross. There's, there's only a very few that my name is actually in the credits for. Often uh, you kind of get lumped under testing, <laughs> the testing department. So online. did you do mostly testing but, or also some editing on um, the text as well for the translations? Um, mostly editing, yeah, especially for Animal Crossing. That was, that was actually great fun. I got to help coordinate sort of the real hardcore look at the text because that game has a lot of sort of variation and uh, dialogue mm -hmm. trees. Mm -hmm. and is is time to real life events and so forth so there might be a single text cell that only shows up if it's a tuesday and it's raining and it's three days until 
the toy day events and you're talking <laughs> to a particular villager who you're friends with at a certain level, wow. then you will see wow. this one specific tech. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but sure. but it was basically that and it was a lot of fun. So, so you're I never saying got sick though of it. that if we think we see some like of the trademark snarky de uh, deadpan sort of Joe Pacini humor in <laughs> Animal Crossing New Leaf that it might be that we're recognizing it correctly. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, no. The editing oh, was okay. a lot more limited at, at Nintendo. That was one of the things I had to get used to at Paizo was, and it's great, um, especially seeing we have a great team of editors now, too, uh, mm -hmm. who have a lot of freedom to make the text better, <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> and it, you know, at my time in Nintendo, it was more of an advisory role, really, where you would say, hey, this seems like it might be a little off, and then somebody who you often wouldn't see you'd sort of interact through a, a queue of uh, issues would mm -hmm. sort of decide whether or not they were going to take that to heart. Whereas at Paizo, it's very, very collaborative and everybody talks to each other and, and finds the best way to say things, Absolutely. including and snarkily. I mean, <laughs> we have like this, this, the whole movement in, in editing. And honestly, like you were one of the people who was doing this in editing like early on and it got more adopted too, is to look in and edit, not just for the best language and best expression, but also look at sort of other components of what's going on. Like, I remember when you came to me with the Pathfinder Society scenario with what was clearly a design issue during editing. I'm like, Joe, thank goodness you spotted this. Yeah, and I, especially now as a developer and designer, I super appreciate when editors take the time or have the time or, you know, <laughs> a mix of, of either <laughs> to spot stuff like that and bring it to our attention because mm -hmm. it just saves us from so many things. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a, it takes the, a village. The editing department's getting just better and better at doing that. I'm really impressed with with everyone there. Shout out to the editors, if anybody. Yay, watching. editors! Go editors! We've had a few editors on the show, and we, we um, people on the show are very su um, supportive of editing in general. I think there's some people who either edit or are looking to get into that too. But like mm. all the time, edit only gets called out when it's like this typos got through who was editing this but really <laughs> edit is doing such a good job and you just usually don't note it because they made it easy to read and you just read through yeah we talked about that song with uh with leo last week mm -hmm. yeah it's it's the when it's done well it's sort of invisible and that is a shame <laughs> right there's but good on you for calling them out because i i agree they're critical all right. So and when you're editing, uh, editing for Animal Crossing, like what what is it like editing the animal leaves? These sort of uh, <laughs> unique speech patterns, shall we say, that and uh, catchphrases that uh, that the characters have. That that could be interesting. Uh, a lot of it's done with macros, right? So that whatever item they ha they happen to be talking about can be filled in automatically. Mm. Um, and trying to keep in mind what. Because a lot of the text would just be, wow, you're giving me a blank? Thanks. This blank is great. Uh, <laughs> not not everything is going to work in those blanks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just the fact that they're animals. I remember there was some text about teeth chattering. And, you know, as pedantic as I am, I mean, it was my job to be editing the text. I was like, well, some of these are birds and don't have teeth that chatter. <laughs> so that, that's the level of my contribution, just to make it clear. <laughs> so now there won't be birds with teeth. Or there were because they, they went to the faceless people and they were like, we're not putting in Joe's chains. <laughs> I don't recall if that one made it through or not. I could I could totally respect the decision to ignore that feedback entirely. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I respect not adding teeth to the beaks of birds. I think that would be, teeth and beaks would be kind of horrifying. I mean, by the time it gets to, you know, the editing stage uh, and the testing stage, that kind of thing's pretty much out the window. <laughs> like, how can you have like, Ducula much easier. If, it, if you can't have fangs on the job? You're assuming we it's want cool. Ducula. <laughs> I'm not going to go on record saying there isn't some kind of duck with fangs. I mean, there's a lot of custom right. animals in the I'm just saying, the if there ever is, is like a duck folk, they could probably have a, a Dompier versatile heritage, right? And then they would have fangs. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting ideas. We have the drift duck yeah, already I mean, made. Joe, by... <laughs> if you told me that there was a vampire duck in Starfinder as an ancestry, I would believe you. Well, you, that's yeah, one of I the mean... awesome things about Starfinder. You yep. can play anything. It's true. Yeah, what are we? I, I always like to say it. We're up over a hundred playable species, just mm -hmm. playable, which makes me happy. I don't know why exactly, but maybe because it's kind of part of the point of the brand and the and the yeah. game is just. Getting to be whatever weird thing you want to be. 
get 150 of them and then see if somebody can <laughs> play them all. Gotta catch them all. Oh. Oh. I get it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have some favorites among the uh, playable ancestries in Starfinder? Goodness. That's a question I could have easily predicted. <laughs> I'll say, like, not to be too vanilla, but I really do like androids uh, and Sheeran, uh, both from our core core races, core species. Some types of classics but, are good. But I don't know. I just I I hate to be the the person that has their like species they wrote and and they love them. <laughs> do it. But I do I do like the Vlaka, which are. Not just furries, they are <laughs> cool uh, dog people, though. Um, That's cool. Awesome. I, mean, I like. You could have I just like... been pandering and said Raxolites. Or... <laughs> well, Raxolites are super dope. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. thank you for I've... that completely yes. unprompted compliment. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many, and I've been working on uh, Alien Archive Four. I say slowly trying to remember whether it's announced and everything. Of course it is. Yes, good. Yay. Alien Archive 4. So my head is, has been swimming with aliens lately, and so I'm trying not to mention any that are in <laughs> that are not yet known. Yeah. Uh, but there's definitely some cool ones coming up. Uh, this but is yeah, Rex Lights. <laughs> this is a that? safe place to say your head is swimming in with aliens. You will not get checked <laughs> up or anything yeah. for that. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, it's my job, right? So yep. it works mm -hmm. out. It's been actually been a lot of fun working with John Compton, uh, one of the newer members of the Starfinder team, to uh, just kind of split up the aliens, like, oh, you want to work on this weird thing? Okay, I'll take that one, and, and we'll hmm. talk to each other about, does this make sense? Yeah, it does. Let's make it even weirder. <laughs> uh, and, and now just... you have uh, John Compton's sudden flashes of, of inspiration <laughs> that start from one point, and then he just doesn't stop for 15 minutes until he's fleshed this entire thing out on your team. <laughs> yep. It happens. It, it <laughs> it's does a thing. Happen. It's a power that <laughs> it can be harnessed power. for good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's one of the things uh, we're definitely missing out on a little bit with our work from home situation these days, uh, which is of course you know uh, there are many worse things. <laughs> yeah, no more creepy uh, uh, Furbies. Come on. Oh my god, those creepy Furbies, John Compton. <laughs> yeah, that's why I, I, I thought of that right away. Yeah, something like this Stitch Necronomicon Furby thing. <laughs> When I talk wow. to him about Furbies being creepy, because <laughs> because that's how friendship works, apparently. It plays. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Affirming that you're right, that they're creepy. It's showing just how creepy they can be. <laughs> Thanks for the subscription, Sheppy. Yeah, thank you. Ooh, wow. That's awesome. Well, you asked me if I wanted to talk about anything before I came on, and that's right. there, is, there is something I want to talk about. OK. Yes. And I hope that's OK. Please yeah, tell us what you want to talk about. It's called the Deck of Many Worlds. <laughs> and now everyone just like rolls their eyes and tunes out because I always talk about it. No, I think, I think people in the audience <laughs> like the Deck of Many Worlds. I remember it coming up at some point and people thought it was cool. Let's, well, see. Let's should, see what they say. There's, a, there's they kind of a meme on about. our channel where uh, uh -oh. the tyranny of the GM tools, which is that people always <laughs> vote for ep like episodes that are about like GM inspiration and GM tips are super <laughs> popular here. So I think that... Workshops uh, have been doing workshops well Workshops have been doing well too. too. But you could build a planet using the deck of many worlds. That's true. You sure can. You can even uh, sort of build out. There's there's one side of one instruction card that is how to use it to generate a player character idea, which I did in my last Starfinder game. I could not pick. It, it turned out that I was paralyzed by the choice of 100 plus playable oh, wow. species. Um, but I just asked my GM, hey, give me a number between 1 and 100. And I forget the exact number now, but I ended up with a, uh, oh my gosh, a Goss Claw. What are the AP uh, playable species with real flexible necks. That's what I focused in on. Joe used flexible. to also give us a, a new world set up from the deck every day at his cube. And I remember my oh, favorite yeah. was the one that was like, um, everyone wanted to settle there uh, from all sorts of developed worlds, even though it didn't have that developed of a culture, but it was like highly toxic. It had no natural resources <laughs> or strategic value. <laughs> and it, even if you had your armor, it was still dangerous to go there. It's like that's a real hook. Like, why do they want to settle yeah, there? Like, exactly. that really made me want to know why they're doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find so this for the one person maybe who doesn't know what it is. It's a deck of a hundred cards uh, that you can combine. Uh, and I came to both of you, I think, separately at different times, asking. 
for the math help on like, okay, so if given these parameters, how many possible combinations are there? And I think mm -hmm. we've come up with something like 9 billion, which I just, uh, I called it millions on the, on the packaging, just yeah. in case, just to yeah. hedge our bets. <laughs> but, well, also uh, because when I figured out how many combinations you can make with the core rule book, marketing and Eric, I think rightly said, when you get into two billions, trillions too high, people kind of lose track of it and actually is less impressive than millions because mm -hmm. it's just so unrelatable. Well, that's that's why I did it then, to be more relatable. There you go, yeah. more relatable. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, and, and the way they combine is such that any two cards, uh, depending on the order in which you draw them, you're going to get something different. Uh, mm -hmm. And it helps you build out a world with physical attributes, cultural attributes, uh, different species that live there, and then a couple hooks. And I think one of my favorite combinations, and, and going back to what you were saying, Mark, uh, about having these questions about the worlds, that's my favorite part, I think, is sometimes things just work out really well. You get the lawful evil world that has lawful evil creatures on it and, it, every, and is a terrible place to be based on the hooks and it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. But I think I prefer the ones that are super weird and almost counterintuitive at first because they do prompt questions and stories and Right. You know, make you want to figure out what's happening. But one of my favorites was uh, a combination of two hooks. The first was it's it's uh, people are magically teleported there uh, when they face disaster. So if, you know, a meteor is about to hit some planet uh, and wipe out, you know, an entire continent, those people are, are magically transported to this world. So people are are saved from disasters by being put on this world. And then the other hook was that it's a hunting ground where one sapient tracks, like hunts other species. Oh, <laughs> so, wow. Well, so that's... you ended up with this world. It's like, yeah, we're saved. And they're like, oh, why, why are they coming after us with the hunting Joe, party? That, that is for sure somewhere an isekai sci-fi anime where it's like, <laughs> I was about to die. I'm reincarnated in another world with superpowers, but we're all being hunted by this really powerful yes. <laughs> entity that sent us here. It's trying to find the ultimate warrior or something. Exactly. And it, it does occasionally generate uh, existing things like pretty, I mean, pretty regularly, actually. I don't actually like, mean um... that I know an anime that does that. No, I, mean, I know, yeah. I'm just certain that there is one because there's so many isekais. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's awesome. But yeah, it's sort of like, it's a combination of all those like big D100 charts that you would generally roll, but then drawing the cards does all the work for you. Yeah, it's, a, it's just a fun little product and I thank you for letting me talk about it. And I am always, always down for people to tell me about what worlds they've made. I'm always kind of searching around for a deck of many worlds on the internet to see, because most people, once they try it out, they like to share what kind of crazy concept they've come up with Eltro says me. the title i gave was too short for a light novel isekai <laughs> what okay. about uh, could... apocalypse apocalypse averted <laughs> world new championship fighting arena no i, I, I <laughs> nowadays they're online. doing like weird que <laughs> questions right so it would be like hey did i get sent to another world just to take part in the most dangerous game <laughs> that would be the name that would be the name of the of the isekai <laughs> just like giving these ideas away for free there you go <laughs> um Elftro is now considering buying um deck of many worlds even without playing starfinder and yeah. agrees yep. that the one that I came up with this sounds like one of the ones. There's yeah, I mean, if you if you are if you have any sort of game where the idea of being able to come up with new and exciting worlds is appealing to you, then yeah, you don't have to be playing Starfinder to draw inspiration from the deck. And even though yes, it will give you some species from Starfinder, you can just make a mapping if you need to of the species into species that are in your setting really easily and that's just one component of the thing that can do yeah uh the it it refers to this in the instructions but i have seen people miss it that you know we have the sfrd online the resource document that it has all the information including flavor about these species for free mm -hmm. so you can just type them in uh yeah it's it's pretty neat and going back to that hundred hundred plus playable species all the cards have a playable species on them so and a, and a threat species. So right. there's 200 different alien. You know, even just looking at them can give you ideas. It doesn't have to be that exact alien. Like you said, you can map it to whatever you want. 
If you're Star Wars, it can be a Wookiee instead of some big hairy thing that you don't right. recognize from Starfinder. <laughs> yeah. Like, it'll work exactly. out. Exactly. And it's like, it's, it's like a version of those D100 charts except more interactive and it has awesome art and there's a lot more going on at the same time on them. So they're yeah. really cool. And Joe figured out a way to make it so that like the cards are all... There's, it's not like there's a threat ca species card and a... Um, danger species card, like all of the cards are the same type of card, but just you, you depend, you use them in a different way depending on the order you draw them to get the combination. Yeah, you sort of uh, lay them over each other, and I tried to make it as efficient as possible, like a little puzzle uh, that's not hard to figure out. Hopefully, so. Hopefully. Speaking of puzzles, uh, speaking of yeah. puzzles, you're a you're a big puzzle fan, that's Joe, right. who has created puzzles for thing for events such as uh, Pizo, Pizo the Pizo Pizo Con. Puzzle Hunts have been Pizo Joe Con, and Hunts, Jason you work Keeley. Out with Jason Keeley. And we've had yeah. Jason Keeley on before, and we talked to him a little bit about puzzles. Can you tell us a little more about your philosophy on puzzles? Uh, I love them, and I want them everywhere in life. <laughs> 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 so I, I have put at least one in every. Not everything I've written, but I, I do try to stick them into the things that I write for Paizo, and sometimes they get taken out, and that's okay. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, like you said, Jason Keeley and I have been doing Puzzle Hunt for uh, the last three years, um, and then last year at PaizoCon, we got to do a, a panel about puzzles, which was really fun, um, and that's specifically using them in your RPGs uh, when running RPGs. Which we learned is you know we learned as much from the audience as they learned from us, I think. That's cool. But uh, Ron Lundin was also on that panel with us, and he has since joined our ranks as puzzle makers. Uh, uh -huh. mm -hmm. We we actually got an early start on the puzzle hunt for this year uh, before learning that Fizzicon, uh might not happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so <laughs> we we're looking at what we might be able to do to get that still get that out to people somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can if we can work that out, it'd be awesome because. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people do actually end up doing it just online. We we have put up PDFs of the, the PaizoCon puzzle hunts, which are always themed around, you know, Pathfinder, Starfinder. Uh, right. This last year's was cute in that we, the theme of the puzzle was, hunt was, uh, I should say what a puzzle hunt is, shouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, you should well, define yeah. puzzle hunt. Yeah, people know sorry. what a puzzle is, but not necessarily a puzzle hunt. So a puzzle hunt is a, just a packet of puzzles, basically, a series of puzzles that, uh, each puzzle gives you a sort of English word or phrase as an answer, and then you use those answers in a sort of meta puzzle, one final puzzle, to get a final answer. Uh, and at PaizoCon, we've been fortunate enough to be able to give out prizes and, and celebrate people having done the whole thing. Uh, but where was I going with that? So yeah, that's, that's basically what a puzzle is. So it's just a, a bunch of different kinds, you know, word, and we, we try to for the puzzle hunt in particular, we try to make it a variety of challenging, uh, of challenge ratings. So what am you I trying to say? You don't hunt down the puzzles. You just get the entire yeah. packet. Yes. In fact, yeah. I, I, does, does the name puzzle hunt come from MIT Mystery Hunt, where the end of solving the meta puzzle is you actually hunt down a real physical object that's on the campus? Or did, or did the word puzzle hunt come first and then mystery hunt? And now, it, it, I don't know mm -hmm. what the order is. I don't know. That's a great question. Uh, that would it's explain definitely... why Hunt is in there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why we called it that, but that's what we call it now. <laughs> uh, we could look at renaming it, make yeah, the, no, it a little no, more no, accurate. No, no, no. no. <laughs> the, the term Puzzle Hunt is the one that's commonly used now. I'm just wondering whether that term came from Mystery Hunt or that it was just already in the zeitgeist. It, I'm only now thinking about the irony of the, like, we do everything we can to try to show people where that, puzzle packets are at PaizoCon. It's like, the here, take game these. Where <laughs> we don't. Just... I definitely have seen people who, who, not our puzzle hunt, but other puzzle hunts are like, oh, I have to hunt down the puzzles? Where do I? And, and yeah, yeah. Like, no, you get them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I... Oh, sorry, though, we derailed you. Now that we've explained the puzzle hunt, you were going to oh, talk yeah. about the cool things about the PaizoCon puzzle hunt. Oh, mm -hmm. sure. Like last year's so, cute combo. Yeah, last year was, uh, we said that uh, we had asked some goblins to help out to sort of celebrate the release of second edition. And <laughs> so we said that goblins had helped us make the puzzle. And, and so they were standard puzzles to some extent, like there was a crossword, but the, since goblins made it and they're not the most literate even now <laughs> necessarily, That's they true. misconstrued sort of how the puzzle was constructed. So they, uh, I don't want to part of the puzzle. Each puzzle is figuring out 
how did the goblins mess up making this crossword? <laughs> yeah. So it, it's it's a crossword, but it doesn't work like a normal crossword, and you and you have to figure out which of the rules they broke, and then solve the puzzle from there, which was a lot of fun. Making puzzles is its own puzzle, and uh, so I get oh, to have fun sure. with Jason and now Ron making them, and it's it's good times. Um, puzzle making is in some ways um, even more fun than solving them, but in other ways it's not. I it's had, true. I had a friend in college who was obsessed with puzzles, so for his birthday I would always make a, like a little mini puzzle hunt for people to try to solve, and it can get tricky to make them also for one that people are willing to do, even at a birthday event for someone who likes puzzles, mm -hmm. without just giving up and being like, well, this is too much, but also... At, like have enough content that people are willing that that people are not like oh well wow this was just over and what mm -hmm. was the point yeah it's like very the, the very... crossword of friendship memes i like the crossword of friendship yeah. memes with it, our whole friend group trying what? to just figure like out weird, what you were referencing weird memes that were in the friend group that nobody else would know also <laughs> there was one where i just said outrageous chuck norris like statements about our friend that just were like <laughs> It's like, this friend is like, uh, and, and they turned out they were all Magic the Gathering glosses that are at the bottom of uh, a card, but I just replaced his name for whatever it was. <laughs> and people figured awesome. it out, and then they figured out eventually that all of the cards had the same converted mana cost, and that number was the uh, mana solution from that puzzle, or mm -hmm. things like that. It, that's like, they really weren't, awesome. They I weren't that it. hard, but they the point was just to get people being humorous <laughs> about that friend. <laughs> It can be hard to gauge how hard a puzzle is, when, especially when you've made it and you know the answer sometimes is like, this is way too easy. I actually thought that about last year's. I thought I was like, oh, these are probably too easy and people, and I got specific comments that was like, this is harder than the year before. <laughs> it's like, okay, I have no idea. I know you, you both have uh, helped out testing the puzzle hunt before too, uh, which very appreciated. <laughs> Oh, um, you get to do puzzles? Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah, I know. <laughs> you, 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 you act like it's such an onerous thing to be like, hey, would you like to preview these puzzles? <laughs> okay, I get to preview but puzzles. Puzzle testing is a really good way to figure out what you're going to do like, and how it's going to work out for your for your intended audience, too. Like, I, mm -hmm. uh, Lynn and I have done MIT Mystery Hunt, which is, like, I guess one of the largest puzzle hunts, and... I honestly wouldn't recommend it if you aren't really into MIT Mystery Hunt, even mm -hmm. if you like right. puzzles, because yeah. of the fact that the winning team makes the next year's, and they do things that just, like, they know are the obvious thing to do, mm -hmm. so that even mm -hmm. if you like puzzles, I've had situations where, like, I was on a pretty good team, and they, they set me with a puzzle, and I was I, I had this burst of insight, and I thought I had done something, and I had really done something good, but it was just mm -hmm. garbage. And I spent a few more hours, and I was like, no, this is worthless. And someone came over who was one of the more experienced people, like, what do you got there? I, was like, I thought I had figured something out, but then I just got this. And they're like, oh, well, obviously what you should have done was, uh, no, you've got the answer. You've had it for, since you had that burst of insight. But, there, oh, no. but even though the directions didn't tell you to do this, you should have done this thing where you, based on the number that was there, indexed into each of the things <laughs> that you had already written by this exact amount. It's yeah. just a standard thing that everyone knows to check and it's if you like, had done that right. you would have seen a word <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah certain certain puzzle uh communities definitely have their own vocabulary and expectations like there's a puzzled pint is, is pretty fun if you've uh, i think it's pretty much everywhere where you just go to a restaurant or a bar i think sometimes and get a packet of puzzles to do and they're they're, they're high quality and i think they're online too that's cool. uh, oh, that's but they cool. but they have they definitely use like Morse code and semaphore and Braille like regularly where where you might not think to right. translate something or like you were saying indexing. That's kind of a thing yep. saying like take the nth letter of this word and, and do something with it like that's that can be assumed pretty hardcore. Right. And, it, and it wasn't and, even considered the puzzle in, in the case of the one yeah, I was yeah. doing it, there was no clue or hint to that. The hints had gotten me to do some, it was like a text adventure puzzle where mm -hmm. I had figured out mm -hmm. like what the commands the person had entered were because it was just describing things in a text adventure, mm -hmm. but it might not have been right. Yeah. 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 It's tricky. That's, puzzles it is. Puzzles are tr tricky to write and to get them to the right level because mm -hmm. I'm sure those puzzles were fine for like the actual top competitive groups in the mystery hunt that were mm -hmm. like the ones who might have found the coin, and, uh, but for the people who are just like coming there to have fun, they can be tricky because you it's, don't know. Uh, it's cool to watch people solve puzzles in ways you totally didn't expect. Mm -hmm. Like oh, I know yeah, I had sure. a, 
I had a puzzle that I put into Council of Thieves that was like basically that was based around uh, like multiple, uh, multiple basically D12s that were rotating around and things like that, and you're trying mm. to figure out what way to turn the crux and things like that. It was for the cellist, the cellist crux, crux puzzle, yeah. yeah. Um, uh. And I thought it would you sort of figure out by like picking up the picking up the dice and kind of turning them around. But my friend, the same one who's super into puzzles, like drew out like this graph theory. Um, <laughs> this graph theory version Which model totally of, solved the, it. of the dice that has possible turning wow. patterns and it's like oh yes yeah, so this is what oh it is gosh. I'm like can you show me how you did that because I'm a math major and he was a math major who's a year ahead of me and was like a lot better than me and did a lot of those sorts of things had done a lot of math competitions and was just more exposed to a lot more things so it's like please teach me the math behind what you just did that's that awesome cool. I, I, and I like, I like that a lot that you incorporated the dice um i think that's a really fun thing to do not just with puzzles but sort of inventing mini games is another thing i really like to do mm. in rpgs is like how can we take the supplies we know we have at the table which are you know standard rpg dice and maybe something to write on and and make some like an interesting experience that sort of stands out from the norm uh constantly messing with stuff like that which also sometimes gets cut but sometimes gets improved and <laughs> makes it the final well in yeah. the original console of thieves it's got like a whole essay on like puzzles are not appropriate for your games because your players don't want to solve them and there is this <laughs> dodecahedron but just roll an intelligence check and linda was like my players do want to solve yeah. it and it was really well because um because we were didn't have a full tape we weren't gonna have a full session we only had three players and all three of them were puzzle fanatics so it's like it was all me right. that ah. guy and another guy who was really really into puzzles <laughs> and that was it nice. like, this entire session is going to be this complex puzzle and we're all it didn't really take the whole session once he did the graph yeah theory. i know it was, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was like an hour or whatever yep. but people were playing around with it in different ways but I mean, it turns out, right, you read the room and do the game that everyone wants to play. Exactly. And you're good. Shocking. <laughs> yeah. Who Not knew? Not that we've given that advice before on this show. <laughs> a lot, a lot of times. Yeah. Here we are. Now I'm, I'm thinking, uh, I'm, so I'm currently writing one of the volumes of Fly Free or Die, uh, uh, a yeah. new Starfinder AP that's coming out. Oh, sweet. At some point. Uh, and now now I'm thinking, like, God, I don't think I have enough puzzles or mini games in my adventure. <laughs> I think I need to stick some more in there. I'll see if uh, Jason Tondra is okay with that. Should I be fine. Imagine. And then the Jane see. character at the table can just shoot the puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I no. I think it's important to have the strength check that helps helps mm -hmm. align the you know the giant dodecahedron or whatever. That's oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Someone's got to actually push the thing into place, right? Like. Yep. Uh. Yeah, now I'm just flashing back to our puzzle panel because we talked about all this stuff and, and how to how to get everyone involved and how to even explain. Like, I, I was running a game once and somebody, you know, at the table figured the puzzle out and shouted out the answer, but their character wasn't anywhere near it in the game. Right. And they were way mm -hmm. down the hall. And it's like, how are we going to justify that exactly? Yeah. <laughs> um, I usually justify it as, like, just let everybody work together on it. Somebody has probably playing a character whose int is so much higher than anybody's actually is at the table that yeah. the extra voices in their head can be, we can all say that the <laughs> wizard would did it, even mm -hmm. if it wasn't the wizard's right. player. Yeah. <laughs> One of my tricks I like uh, the idea of anyway is if a, if a sort of high int player, low int character figures it out, then it's just that character's favorite number or something and they're like of course it's 38 that's my favorite number like <laughs> <laughs> why wouldn't it be <laughs> and, then and the it just happens like, to work you figured this out so quick yeah. <laughs> it just uh, felt like it right <laughs> that's awesome. it. or maybe they heard it before right yeah exactly like, right we were doing a, a like a tournament style play that was timed at one point and like they gave me a handout to read to the group was, there were like seven ways to go labeled a through g and I was like, okay, the beginning of eternity, the end of, we go through E. Because <laughs> you've heard that one before. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's that's another, I think we even, yeah, gave a similar example of like, you know, in our, in my hometown, my grandmother would always tell us this story. And it's like this exact, so it's just a parable for this puzzle. I kind of, it, right? I, yeah, I, I love figuring out the answers to weird questions. I think that's one of the most fun things we get to do. Uh, uh, along with posing creativity. those weird questions for <laughs> sure 100 percent. if you don't have the weird question you're never going to try to 
justify and come up with the really cool answer to the question. Well, it's just like the weird question of why is everybody trying to settle on this planet that seems to yeah, be on the no, surface I, have nothing interesting I think to. that's what Joe was yeah. circling yeah, yeah. back to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, we, I always thought that if I could get a job justifying things that I would be doing pretty well. And I guess <laughs> in a way that is kind of what I'm doing. Now, that's not to say I don't do a ton of hand waving, especially in Starfinder, oh, sure. <laughs> because it's magic in space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So there can be Dyson spheres. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Justifying is a thing, though, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. a lot of a lot of different people. Like sometimes, uh, we have questions like from the editors, or and we, we we're thinking about oh, so is there a good justification to keep it like this way? And one person, <clears throat> the company is also really really good at justifying is is Ron. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah. I think from maybe his lawyer skills, yeah. he'll he'll spin a yarn that like makes the thing make sense, even if he pr might not have intended it beforehand. He's like, no, but see, it could make sense from this direction. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess that yep. makes sense. Like as a lawyer, you have to be able to you have to be able to consider all the possibilities of how something may have happened. In life. Right. It's no surprise that he enjoys and helps now helps make these puzzles that we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another thing we're missing now right now is uh jason keely puts up a puzzle of the week or oh, yeah. of the day or of the month on his whiteboard and mm -hmm. uh in his cube and ron is one of the regular customers uh <laughs> coming to solve and i'm always kind of in a race in my head against him and he always wins <laughs> the race between ron and joe and ron always wins and if you oh, solve yeah, the puzzle sure. you get a piece of fun size candy that's right it's true yeah yeah but you still get no the longer candy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. What what do you mean? You oh, still, you still will get eventually it's Ron won. So if you don't, so that's true. Yet. Yeah, <laughs> he does get first pick. So if it ever mm -hmm. comes down to oh, like that's true. a mm -hmm. Jolly Rancher versus a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup, then I guess I lose. Well, but he didn't have nine pounds of runs like Logan. <laughs> 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 Who was yeah, it that had the giant it goblet stuff. of like M and M's? Was that? That was. But Liz had the Liz had a giant like or the container of kind of container of M and M's with a spoon that with she parcelled out. With a spoon that she'll out. like she, she has like a container of M and M's with a spoon, and you can like put out your hand and she'll she'll. Pour and also, M &Ms Buckeyes with a spoon from Ohio. Yeah, yeah. Once There's a lot after of food in Paizo office. It's true. After creating sort of more of a stink than I meant to, uh, asking just some innocent questions about lore, I think of Mark Morland's at the time. Uh, <laughs> that opened up this whole like, oh, these books don't comport. Now we got to figure out which way we're going. I got a, a can and put a bunch of gummy worms in it and just, uh, <laughs> which was not like the most attractive presentation, I'll admit, but people still ate them. <laughs> so I had my, my edible can of worms to, in honor of uh, yes. annoying people with my editor. There questions. you go. <laughs> there is no such thing as an innocent. This lore seems to conflict when it comes to Moreland. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> That's what I learned right. that day. Yes. <laughs> He's going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. In-world in stuff is fun. I, I like, I, I've, I'm highly impressed by my colleagues' ability to keep track of everything. I absolutely need access to PDFs to, to keep track of virtually anything. Um, That's a lot. But I, I can keep track of lore facts, but like nobody can keep track, and the rules, but nobody can keep track of what piece of art exists and is where, <laughs> like John Compton. Yeah. Mm. He'll be like, he oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah, we had yeah. a piece of art of that. It was on page 183 of this book. It's like, how? It was like, how did you know that? Like, how could you possibly know that, John? So, yeah, I just memorized where all the art is. Like, it's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. I think he just made. did that, actually. Was it him or Thirsty? I can't remember. I, it Amanda. Was probably John. It was him. Yes. You're talking about the one who found the art of that particular character who's associated with the one of the iconics. Uh, this was a wrestling, pic oh, a okay. wrestling picture for mm -hmm. for the new Starfinder stream. Oh, uh, oh yeah. That just started. Story then. Yeah, Amanda was looking for. She was asking the Starfinder team, like, "Hey, does anyone know of any sort of like?" arena combat or like hyped audience kind of art and and somebody found it and i it wasn't anyone who worked on the volume that had the art in it then it was probably it was yeah, yeah. it's john john or thirsty so. yeah yeah a lot of talented people with a lot of really niche talents too yeah. in addition to their like real world skills and genius thirsty, uh, well thirsty will know like the the name of the person who worked on the thing and mm. john will know like the lore facts <laughs> Or, or where the art piece is in the book. It's real handy. It's it's yeah. it's good to have on our team. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm really good at pressing uh, Control F or Command F depending on the the computer. So that is not to brag. Skill, right? Well, I mean, I know you also like created some created some some things to make it easier for people to search PDFs and stuff like that for. And in That's the office, true. So that was that was super useful as but, someone who needs to search for PDFs as well. I'm a real big fan of uh, efficiency and tool use. So yeah. you always got to be careful not to spend more time making a process more efficient than you save from that process being more That's efficient. That's right. Mm -hmm. it's but, the real but trick. hey, I mean, you were able to get up the cool new Starfinder um, fact and errata page. Oh, yeah. Right? I actually, I wrote that down. I wanted to talk about that. Oh, that, but you didn't is... mention it to us before. But no. then I thought about it yeah. as a thing that you helped make more efficient. <laughs> yeah. So oh, can yeah. you I mean, tell that, us about that... that process now? Oh, the most exciting process of all. I will absolutely. It, it, Our audience it comes down, likes it. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a big team effort, and you know, uh, we hadn't had an official fact update for a couple of years, I think. And with people transitioning into different job roles, including me moving into uh, lead designer for Starfinder, I really wanted to tackle people's burning questions that they'd had for a long time, you know, and, and to some extent given up on some of them. Just sad. Uh, but we've just been so busy <laughs> and remain mm -hmm. so busy. Mm -hmm. uh, but over over a long period of time, I carved out little bits of time. I answered some questions, uh, not not alone, of course, always bringing it to the team and getting a lot of input, which is really helpful. Uh, and uh, working with the, our tech team, uh, specifically Ray, Marissa, and Andrew, uh, they put together this cool new searchable FAQ and errata uh, section for our website that is just really, really easy to use now and easy for me to use and update on the back end. Um, and so I've been kind of combing through older issues and newer ones and, you know, prioritizing where I need to still can't answer every single thing just because, uh, you know, for, for yeah. various reasons. <laughs> also, I'm always, you know, developing a book and outlining a book and working mm -hmm. with freelancers on a book and, mm -hmm. It's never just one thing at Paizo. No. It's always like at least five things. Which is yeah. great, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it has its advantages. It all, you're always, you always have something interesting to do. And personally, I find it helps, you know, sometimes you get bogged down in one particular project. Well, no problem. There's always something else to also be working on. <laughs> so, uh, Depends on how bogged you are. The well, project. this is true. We want. <laughs> yeah. at, at, some, at, at some point of Game Master, you guys, Logan and I were bogged enough in it that we also couldn't do any of the other things because that's yeah. an advantage of work play because the products are shorter so even if you're bogged in one project for a while it's not going to be more than a few weeks at a time mm -hmm. i never considered that now i'm a little jelly i'm not gonna lie <laughs> yeah we'll also try managing like no, More no. More than 20 products okay. at the same time. I'm not jelly anymore. <laughs> Joe, Joe knew before you said it that there, there were a lot of other, lot of other things. Yeah. That was the quickest reverse I've ever experienced. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, never mind, never mind. Glad to be of service, yeah. Joe. First of all, <laughs> Stump Monkey is very thankful to you, Joe, for the facts. Uh, the joy and occasional tears people show in Discord when there's new answers is always great to see, says Stunt Monkey. <laughs> you know, and I, I actually really appreciate that people uh, will express uh, their satisfaction with the question being answered, even though it doesn't comport with their understanding of the rule. For instance, mm -hmm. like, uh, I think that's really, uh, I don't know, commendable to be like, hey, I don't agree with this, but I appreciate that it exists now and that this matter's sort of settled, even if it didn't come out my way. Um, and I think that's really mature and awesome. Yeah, that's so, good. That's good. We yeah. didn't always get to that bar on some of the responses to sure. the cues. Um, but when we do, I'm always grateful. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, perhaps more notable for its rarity. But but it, just in terms of my recent experience, it's been really positive And I awesome. am very thankful for that. So people have been pretty great about it. Because yeah, we get we get invested in these games. It's it's so it's, a, it's an interesting dichotomy that you know, you really we're really uh, other than org play. So forgive me, Linda. <laughs> we are we are trying to give people the tools to do whatever they want, right? Like to to play the exactly the game that they want with you know if they want all puzzles or really hard puzzles, <laughs> or even ones that require graph theory instead of just are solvable by them. <laughs> They should be able to do that. Uh, and if they want none, they should be able to do that too. They should be able to ignore mm -hmm. Starship Combat if they want, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Um, but we also, we want 
the rules we do provide to be clear and make sense and be balanced so that you don't have to customize anything. You can just run right. it as written and, and be successful and, and have a good time. So it's, it's an interesting line to walk all the time. And there's, there's sort of a, a, another second reason for that. That's um, that there's just, there are a lot of people who are comfortable saying, I'm going to change everything. We're going to do all puzzles. We're going to make this work. But there's also, especially newer people, but sometimes experienced people who are more like, well, Paizo are the professional. They're putting it out. I'm going to run mostly with what's in there because I don't know what changes will happen if I make adjustments to that. And so there are people who rely on it for sort of the convenience and the knowledge and sort of the um, the mental well-being of knowing that, okay, you know, Paizo it has, got, has got our back and it has, it has the professionals all looking at this. And that's why... I feel like even though, sure, you can change it and you can come up with an answer to it that it's, it's on us to give an answer and one that we think will work best for most games. And someone who vociferously disagrees enough to um, really, really express why they disagree and they have a really good rationale, they know why, they they are not the ones that it's for because they know the game well enough to they can make their change probably pretty uh, confidently without having knock-on effects they're not expecting. Now, granted, they might be playing with a GM who does not share their opinion and who wants to use mm -hmm. right. our so it doesn't always work out, but... Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, we, we definitely have the responsibility to the majority of players to, to give good answers. I mean, you know, in mm -hmm. the first place to, to not have... as To not have too many questions posed by what we're right. writing, trying to be clear. <laughs> but it, it just difficult <laughs> it's really yeah. hard the english language it turns out yeah. it's just so ambiguous even times when i sit there with the editors puzzling being like look it's going to be possible to read this in these two ways so let's rephrase it nope now yeah. it's possible to read it in these two ways mm -hmm. yeah like is yep. there any way to write this that it can only be read in one way yes but it's, yes, five but it's times so pedantic and, really yep. and it's horrible yep. to read and you just I... like why did they write it like that and then we're like what's the best answer and it's hard yeah <laughs> I, I remember having that exact experience from both sides of the coin kind of as an editor being like gosh this this sentence really just goes on and on and like is so specific and has these like very explicit exceptions that are like how niche is that like what's the point and then as a developer being like oh my gosh i gotta put this in or this person's gonna do <laughs> like, <laughs> the rule. Yep. And then yeah it's it's a fun it's a fun dance though ultimately yeah. like it's a, it's a good time Mm -hmm. The dance between readability and clarity and yeah. accurate precision and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. hey, eventually, about that so eventually, you just have to put it in, and we talked about this with Leo a little bit mm -hmm. too. But yeah, eventually, you have to put it in, in a way that can be read, even if it's not, if it technically still is ambiguous, that you can read it and not be like, "What have I just done reading this mm -hmm. sentence?" Yeah, and yeah. then just <laughs> back it if, yeah. for the people who. Um, get caught up in the ambiguity. You need to make sure people don't feel like they're reading a legal technical manual when they're reading Right. The book. Unless totally the rule true. book has a legal technical manual in it on purpose. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> in which case, we would probably hire Ron to do that. Yes. <laughs> That's sort of what I was uh, hinting at earlier a little bit in terms of prioritizing FAQs. Like... Uh, we seem to be oh. having a little bit of a connection issue with Joe here. Is that a connection issue with Joe, or is your entire computer frozen? Or maybe my entire computer is frozen. I think your entire computer the is frozen. Um, Joe, my computer froze for just a minute here. Um, oh. So, let's see. What was the last thing that we heard? What was the sentence that was he was cut off in the middle he of was, it? Uh, he was saying that that was the, something that he was... something that you were thinking about with the fact process. Yeah, with the fact process. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was just saying that I had mentioned it briefly earlier that a lot of go, a lot of considerations go into facking things, and one of those is how sort of widespread it is. Like, how many people are actually affected by this thing versus sort of is it a niche, you know, a corner case uh, that is more of a curiosity uh, of you know a fan who's done a close reading and has a mastery of the system, right? Uh, and obviously the ones that affect more people and are, you know, un pretty unclear as written in, like, say, one source book, that that's definitely going to take priority over 
some of the other more narrow stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a it's a tricky road to walk, and uh, as the as the one who was sort of the fact person who tried to get people together for the facts in in Pathfinder First Edition, <laughs> like I. I recognize a lot of the pitfalls, <laughs> and I, I very much salute the efforts that uh, that you've taken to uh, to achieve what you have for Starfinder. Yeah, I mean, you you are definitely a help. I came to you more than once uh, asking about your process and what how things have gone before, and that was invaluable. And what, <laughs> and what tools sort of... worked and what, what tools yep. didn't work. Right yep, now. Exactly. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yep, <laughs> exactly. All very helpful. Yep. Standing on the shoulders of Cypters. <laughs> Fortunately, our shoulders are not very high off the ground, so it's not that hard. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid of heights, you know, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned having uh, used the, the Deck of Many Worlds to generate a character. What sorts of games have you uh, played in and GM'd recently? Uh, it's actually been a while, uh, partially because of you know, things going on in the world, mm-hmm. but also mm-hmm. just have been so busy and, you know, responsible me took on, well, I don't know which version of me took on this uh, adventure path assignment, but <laughs> <laughs> the responsible me is now, is now uh, working on it. <laughs> there you go. Well, and, that's good to hear that you're... Well, I know well. which part of you took on the assignment. It's whatever part is responsible for... <laughs> Taking it on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very different some meaning of the word, yeah. Have you missed the word play, Joe? Uh-huh. <laughs> the casual you really have to like seek it out now. You have to intentionally yeah. type it in. That's right. <laughs> it's much trickier. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's been I've been pleasantly surprised at how Paizo's been able to or you know, the people of Paizo have been able to maintain a sense of community. Yeah. Uh, despite our digital only interactions these days um it's been pretty cool yeah i feel we're talking to some people more that we're really really far away in the building because mm-hmm. we're having channels <laughs> yeah. that include more people yeah yeah for it's sure it's cool to see all the pictures of people's pets and plants and <laughs> That's right. games and plushies and living spaces and the view out their windows and yep. stuff like that and Luis that reminds has a me. report of his of his cat that he puts up Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was doing those uh, scavenger hunts. I should do another one. Maybe mm-hmm. maybe someone in chat would have a good suggestion. So the first one I did was asking people to sh- take a picture of the nearest dice. Uh, that was fun. Like, oh, yeah. So everyone, today everyone have shared a suggestion in chat for a scavenger hunt. Joe can um, use his powers to make almost everyone <laughs> at Paizo do. Yes. So when I say Joe's powers, what I mean is sometimes even just like you're going out to eat some food with Joe, and it just he'll just make an imperative statement that <laughs> seems like a demand out of nowhere with no context or actual power to leverage people to do it, and then a lot of people will, yep. whatever it is that he said. Mm-hmm. It's and, very strange. I'm, I'm mystified by it myself. I, I can't imagine why anyone would. But it worked with these scavenger hunts. I mean, it's fun to see kind of what the dice that people have uh, near them and. Uh, the other one I did was inanimate eyes. Like, what are the closest inanimate eyes that you can see? What uh, channel was this so, on? I've missed these. Oh, uh, yeah. I this think was I in our, saw that in there. In our goblins. Yeah, it's in I the, goblin the goblins. Channel. Oh, I must just... There's oh, a lot in goblins yeah. channel. It must just have there is a lot, yeah. I will, I will keep an eye out. I want to participate in the next <laughs> one. My favorite part of the Joe imperatives is when you, you <laughs> demand that some, when people do something. and someone gives you something, and it's not, like, exactly what you said. So then you're <laughs> like... Uh, you're like, you know, in, in three words, describe this, and they give four words. You said, I said three words, and they're like, I'm sorry. And they, like, apologize to you. Um, and I appreciate like, that because there were parameters, and they weren't. Uh, you know, we, we live in a society, people. Like. <laughs> I think it's my way of testing just how much people will put up with because it does take some amount of putting up with someone to, to see if hang they, out with uh, me. If they'll put up with... Um, with less um or more um of those kind of things yeah <laughs> to see well, if i set you up get for, f- oh, for fewer on, Joe, i set you up fewer. for fewer oh, oh my god but to be fair to be fair he doesn't he doesn't see the camera so he didn't oh, see you your go. troll face that you just did there <laughs> So, well, the other thing is, you know, people need context for that. I, I worry that people will take that out of context. Like, yeah, so well, out of context or in context, everyone, Joe will just um, 
incorrectly correct or cor correctly correct fewer with less no matter which one you say mm -hmm. as long mm -hmm. as he knows that you know what the correct usage is yes yeah Otherwise, I fear that people will think I'm actually correcting them and making them feel bad, and that's not the point. <laughs> what is the point, you ask? I don't know. But <laughs> so it's... Numbad has a question for you, Joe. Is there anything you oh, miss yes. as an editor that you don't experience as much as the lead designer for Starfinder? Wow, that's a really good question. Uh, I would say sort of the variety is one thing that I miss. Um, I do end up working on, as a someone who works on hardcovers primarily as a developer, the developer part of my job, uh, not just doing fun design things in my head all day. Uh, I'm on a project usually, you know, I'd say like two projects for an overlap of a few months at any given time, right? Mm -hmm. So for a few months, I'm working on two projects and then the next few months, I'm working on one of those and a new one. Uh, so as an editor, I got to see all kinds of stuff, you know, pieces of Pathfinder and Starfinder. And now there's a down side to that too if you're <laughs> if you know the starfinder beginner box and second mm -hmm. edition play test and <laughs> Star Pathfinder Baby. first edition and yeah <laughs> and starfinder like hey, when you have to juggle all the systems two beginner box. that yes. had not been the case for a while mm -hmm. but at least that one is not a fundamentally well i mean who knows what you'll do with it but star you know, star you know, star baby you, you corrected yourself quickly <laughs> yes i caught myself uh star 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 baby which was the in-house name for starfinder beginner box uh was definitely different enough from starfinder that you know i made like a very thorough guide on like here's things that you're you've trained yourselves well to do editors now please forget them <laughs> and, <laughs> and do this entirely different thing for this one product mm -hmm. so they're they were real troopers during that. And I don't necessarily miss also being at the very end of sort of the, the food chain there. Uh, not, not food chain. That sounds like a hierarchy. What I mean is sort of the timing in the process is editors are to the last in there in any product. Food and so chain also make, it being at the end makes it seem like, like the editors are like eaten by the art team, <laughs> eaten by, by the developer. The, yeah. But more, <laughs> but I would say that it doesn't happen like that at all. Anyway, no, no, so. yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. That was a miss, a miss, miss speech. <laughs> by my part. <laughs> Whatever the noun is for that. But in terms of what I miss, I think, yeah, some of the variety, uh, just getting to hang out with the editors more. I get to hang out with, developers now more too but mm -hmm. you know the editors are great folks um judy bauer is the managing editor that hired me on and she's still the managing editor and she just picks great people to work with um who then leave her for other parts of the company <laughs> and then she picks some more new cool people uh, so i mean it, it's it's a system i guess yeah yeah <laughs> it's it works mm -hmm. but yeah that was a, that was a good question i'll have to think more about what i miss um Again, like compared to other editing jobs I've had, the the sort of freedom to question things and to change things is is a really good thing that Paizo is doing with their editors and has been since I've been working there. So to ask the flip side of that question, what are the things that uh, you enjoy with? What are some of the things you enjoy with your new title that you didn't get to either didn't get to do before, or you get to do more, or things like that now? Oh, phenomenal cosmic power, of course. <laughs> yeah. What about the itty bitty living space? Well, that's, yeah, I mean, Aww. it's smaller now that I'm working in my bedroom. So. <laughs> <laughs> too real, too real. No, I, I mean, you uh, get half of a quote, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think, you know, like some of the things that spring to mind immediately, I actually realize we have been involving editors in more, for example, getting to pitch ideas for products um, or being involved really early in products. Like that's something that we're doing more and more. We're bringing in art and we're bringing in edit to these right. initial meetings so that they can contribute these great ideas and make things better. We're trying and to also... find leads who are invested and who, who like the topic and want to be the one who comes in from each team, bringing in um, the ideas from that team and just is in from the ground floor as like a major co-collaborator. Yeah, and it's it works really well. Uh, so that's not unique to being a developer, I guess, or a designer. Mm -hmm. um, getting to address the Fakarata stuff, honestly, is something that I've been interested in since I started, I would say, as a developer. Mm -hmm. That's when I really was like, like oh, I want, to, I want to help out with this process. And there just there was never any time. Mm -hmm. So getting, there, there were even, you know, 
uh, errata that I suggested that I got to implement. Uh, the pocket edition for the Starfinder Core Book is announced, and we have talked about on the forums that we'll be incorporating a lot of errata into those, into that pocket edition mm -hmm. oh, cool. of the Starfinder Core Book. Um, and so I got to do that uh, over a long period of time. And some of those changes I implemented were ones that I had like suggested as an editor when the original book was going through. <laughs> and, you know, at the time it was like, well, that's nice, but we don't have time to do that right now. You know, totally reasonable, uh, soft rejections of my, <laughs> of my <laughs> pleas. Uh, but now, now I kind of, kind of got to come full circle and be like, okay. And, and still, you know, talking to the team and getting buy-in of course, but. You're the uh, one running the process. Now you decide what's important. Well, <laughs> I, I ask people if they agree right. with me that what yeah. I think is important is important. And then usually uh, they set me straight if, I, if I'm off the path a you bit. You're not about consensus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally. Exactly. Um, and then I, I don't know. I just like, I really like just putting in kind of my Keeley is showing sometimes when I get to put in fun references or weird stuff that <laughs> is a little on the goofier side, but it, I think injects fun into the game. Like... I don't know, when I did the art order for Armory, for instance, I put, uh, I asked for a strawberry machine cake sticker on one of the, one of the technological items. It was a key tar, <laughs> basically, uh, just because I could, and I thought it was cool. So that I could, is cool. Well, yeah. Um, or naming feats, goofy names, and then asking the editors if they're okay with it, and then they just give me a string of horrified emojis, but then they don't say, <laughs> actually, they don't say no, so I do it. <laughs> they... They put, they printed and so it's I mean, cool. Having the right name on a feed to sell the feed mm -hmm. to connect people to the feed is really really important and it's something <laughs> that is is undervalued like in the community of um, people who are really deeply into the rules. It's undervalued even in the company itself. Uh, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's it, there's certain like the rules text of the feed the feed could be exactly the same but with the right name. Yeah, it just becomes an amazing feat. And yeah, so, and that can go the other way too, right? Yes. Like um, with the wrong name. It... What is? I think reflecting armor has kind of haunted us. Oh, yeah. I, I'm probably getting the name wrong because it's important that the name is right. <laughs> Elf Trail was talking about the just one more thing from the investigator. That's exactly uh, Elf Trail. Yeah. That is exactly one of the examples that. Whenever it does come out in the office and there's other people who don't want creatively named feats that I'm like, but the fan base loves just one more thing yeah. than any of those names. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's a, there's reasons for it, right? It's not that people are wanting yeah. to be um, to take the game not seriously or be uh, or be like, well, no, we just <laughs> want it to be... Give a, me a, a serious a, business, yeah. Mark Seifert. Yeah, How dare you? It's not that they want it to be a tallest <laughs> feat name. It's that having an exciting and evocative name that actually ties in as an allusion to something that they know mm -hmm. immediately allows them to access the part of their brain that's connected to whatever that illusion is. And sometimes we're giving them rules that, you know, it takes a little time to process what's going on in the rule and it takes a little time to sort of connect to it, but you can connect to it right away if you've got the right name. Naming's powerful. Let me I don't know if I should tell you the feat I was thinking of when I brought this up because oh. <laughs> you made some really good points here and this might just like oh, what, what discredit me entirely. Were, what is the feat you were thinking of? Uh, it is called Quicker Trickler. Quicker Trickler, <laughs> which, okay. Yes, which lets you trickle serums down your allies' throats faster than normal. <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> well, we also cool had... That's fun though, because another thing about a good name is it makes you actually be able to remember what the thing is called. <laughs> I don't know. I I probably should have left it at Mark's eloquent explanation of why names matter and not admitted uh, oh, what I was actually talking I mean, about. Some of the ones that work are, are ones that are like very sneaky for the goblin and then very, very sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, right. Or there's mm -hmm. the um, there's the the goblin feat that's um, oh gosh, it's um, it's something er. I, I even renamed it to this, and I can't remember what it was. But it's like something where you should not put an er at the end of <laughs> of it, and it absolutely has an er. I think it is. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Um, let's see. Where, see if someone in chat can figure it out. Someone in chat figure it out before I did. Um, <laughs> it, oh, unbreakable goblin, and then unbreakable er goblin. Yes, <laughs> I love it. it. Yeah, that's see? perfect. Yeah. 
No, I, um, I, yeah. Stunt Monkey says Pick or Trickler is good because no one's going to forget what it does, and it's, they can tell yeah. what it does immediately, and it's just a touchstone. Yeah. So, Thank you. Um, Your check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate yeah. it. I think everyone who's on this stream agrees with this, but not everybody does. Um, and <laughs> there's a lot of interesting points of view, um, back and forth on, on this exact topic. They go back to things like the old castle of Greyhawk back in the days of D and D that was like the entire thing was just a pun. And mm. there was like mm -hmm. the Pillsbury Doughboy. It was named like almost <laughs> exactly pop and fresh or an elf mm. was named like a very logical elf name like Mista Spock or something like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, like not liking those kind of things. And yeah. Just there's a lot of really interesting viewpoints yeah, on yeah. the topic. I don't want to get too squirreled on it. Squirrel. Oh, no. so squirrel is our um, our name for when we go into a weird side tangent. We have an emoji <laughs> for it that shows a squirrel. Oh. Well, we've very actually easy. managed That's to do fun. pretty well not squirreling. Actually, well, we're already we've already been interviewing you for over About an hour. About an hour. So. Yeah. Uh, is that a failure on our part no. then to you know uh, to not stay on go, brand by no, 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 a lot of them <laughs> for whatever time that uh people want to stay and mm -hmm. uh have fun things to talk yeah, about but i do i do like to whenever i notice that we're past an hour uh just kind of make a note because we always tell our guests that it's a one hour interview so um <laughs> I so. just meant, have we failed ourselves by not squirreling more? Oh, like, no, because I that's don't part think of so. your like, brand. We've so. squirreled very, a variable amount yeah, of Yeah, squirreling okay. is, is a celebration. It is specifically when we, <laughs> when we all pump the emoji. It is not like okay. a, a tisk yes. kiss. It's a celebration that we <laughs> gotcha. did it. But, yeah. Um, in an interview, Joe, you're the topic. So as long as it's something that's related <laughs> to what you are interested in and sort of like your philosophy on stuff, then it can be anything that we want. So it's harder to squirrel in an interview. Yes. Fair enough. As long as we, it's Joe related. <laughs> we, yep. uh, going back to what you were talking about a little bit, we, I ran a, an entire meeting just about Easter eggs one time, uh, talking about those exact issues like, and gosh, what is, I came up with this horrible acronym for, or initial, no, acronym, because it was spelled out a word. It was like, was it? I, can't, I can't remember it, but it was just a terribly belabored acronym to try to, as a mnemonic for all the various <laughs> things to keep in mind for uh, sort of Easter eggy stuff. Like, right. how how's it going to come off? Like, how litigious is the owning entity? Like, right. just uh, does it, you know, fit the tone of the of the thing it is. I, I remember one of the kind of big, actually, what spawned that t discussion was the critical hit deck for Starfinder. Oh, I think right. it might yeah, have been it had several yeah. illusions in there. Yeah, it might have been the critical fumble. Now that I say that, it was one of the two. And mm -hmm. you know, that product is very much a goofy extra for the game that yeah. you're drawing a card and seeing what what wild thing happened. And so it was. I think most of us came to the conclusion that it was appropriate for that to have these sort of tongue in cheek, like very in cheek um, yes. mm -hmm. references and sort of nods to nerd culture, that kind of thing that uh, would definitely not fly in, you know, a serious AP or, or you know, any number of other products really. Right. <laughs> but yeah. For Every that, it just makes sense. In that regard. Yeah, it really I is. And there's, there's a difference between an Easter egg where you're hiding it in there or an illusion mm -hmm. where it's like you're not hiding it in a, in a name that you read it and you realize it's Mr. Spock, but you're just literally making a literary illusion, um, which mm -hmm. in, a, in an AP for the name of an NPC, it's, it's not going to be an illusion most of the time because you've right. just named a character the name of this thing. <laughs> but yeah. when, it, when it comes to rules... It, like the name of a feat, right? Like that's a that's something in the book that the player is reading anyway. It's got a little bit meta, and so you mm -hmm. have situations like the whole gunslinger class in PF one, right? It's got all these names of Western movies as the names of mm -hmm. its abilities, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's just a touchstone to you know what the gunslinger is. But that. like in the world, you don't imagine that gunslingers going around. I mean, I'm going <laughs> to attack you with my ability, and the name of my ability is, is true grit. True grit. Right. 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 Yes. No, that's a good point. Too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we <laughs> and it looks like they say in a way they said in a way the whole interview is a squirrel. 
I think no, wow. because no, the topic <laughs> is the interview, so it's not a scroll. Well, okay, hold on. Well, everybody, everybody, I'm going to direct you to what it says right below the video. The topic is Arcane Mark asked Joe Pacini. And we definitely asked so Joe Pacini. So we're asking things. Joe Pacini a thing. It's on brand. Hey, ask me three more questions. Okay, there, there we go. There, Joe said we we're going to ask him three more questions. All right, are we going to get some nice. good questions through to chat, or are they going to leave it to us? I know the chat's got a little bit of a time delay from from us so we need yep. to give them a little bit because joe uh, is demanding it to okay. all of us together to ask <laughs> yes. him three questions that's correct so that yes. could be could be me could be linda it could be you guys but we have to give him three more so i'm ready I'm yeah mm -hmm. I, I was just prepared. seeing chat um had come up with something if not then i'm going to say i'm going to ask um other than the deck of many worlds uh, what is your favorite uh, little design piece that you've created since becoming um, a developer or Starfinder lead designer? That's tough. Um, I would have to say uh, the unannounced project that I'm working on now with freelancers. Unannounced um, project. There we go. <laughs> but since that's not as interesting... <laughs> I, I had a good time working on the downtime system in, in Character Operations Manual that Liz Liddell wrote. Um, and I worked with her like both before the assignment, during the assignment, and then uh, on my own afterward, just really making that something that I was very interested in and like having in the game. I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, obviously, Pathfinder has the downtime <laughs> yeah. All system right. too. So Numbat has a compound question for you. Uh oh. What do oh, these you are love hard to about remember. living in Seattle and what do you regret? Um I like the long dark winters and I wouldn't say I regret so much as was surprised by how warm it gets here, which is not that warm, <laughs> I will say. <laughs> but I'm a I grew up in the Bay Area in California in sort of a permanent fog bank and so <laughs> I, I grew up in like a narrow band between like 55 degrees and 65 degrees. So I am a, a wimp when it comes to any kind of heat. And it's very beautiful here in the summer. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't say I have any regrets. I definitely, what I'm doing now is, is very much in line with my love of language and games uh, and people. So it's, I can't imagine having gone some other route and not ending up here. Very cool. All right. So the last does that question. count as one? Oh yeah. Okay. We've got <laughs> yeah. one more question. Um, also from Numbat, um, mm. which is of the three Paizo systems, which do you prefer playing? Is that PF uh, Pathfinder First Edition, Second Edition, and Starfinder? I'm guessing. It's gotta be. It's gotta be. It's gotta be. Uh, which do I prefer playing? Mm -hmm. It's it's gotta be Starfinder. I uh, I fell in love with it when I joined paizo and it was coming to editing and i just like weird space adventures very much although i do really enjoy a lot of second edition mechanics especially <laughs> so <laughs> props to i kind of kind of want it all uh but in terms of what's most up my alley i would say starfinder for sure which works out right, right. yeah <laughs> I exactly mean, i kind of want that to be the answer <laughs> yeah exactly right yeah <laughs> that's not yeah <laughs> you, you wouldn't have chosen to move to the starfinder team if you didn't like starfinder exactly <laughs> awesome well um uh, joe has declared that there would be three more questions and there have been three more questions <laughs> yep. thank you for that i appreciate it and number <laughs> says you we should must... have moved south to the san jose mm -hmm. and they actually have uh, summer and still in the bay area Altro thinks that it should have kind of pathfinder starfinder and the card game the card game is made uh, by lone shark card game though. is made by lone shark though so even it's though true. we support it's it with the Paizo Adventure system. Card Society, it's technically not a Paizo. <laughs> and Paizo definitely does some aspects of it, but the game system mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. Lone Shark, so. Oh, Altero, you expect us not to harp on a technicality? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who showed you that you're watching? That's yeah, right. <laughs> oh, great oh. XP leader. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, well uh, thank you very much for joining us, Joe. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a good time. I'd love to come back when uh, this project is announced and talk oh, yeah. years off oh, about yeah. it. The if one you that, we, we, you can, uh, that was your favorite, but you couldn't say yeah. anything about <laughs> Exactly. <laughs>
but thanks for having me. Appreciate All it. All right. All right. Um, so let's say goodbye to YouTube, and then we'll stay on with Twitch and talk a little bit about what's coming up again. So bye, YouTube. See bye. you next time. Bye.